Yes, guys, how are you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show down here from Top Golf Adelstone. Good to see you. I hope you're all happy and healthy doing the things you love. Bugsy Malone's over the back, just getting the ball. She'll be back in a minute to say hello. Guys, we've got some interesting stories today. It is game day. It is the best day of the week, and I'm going to the game today, so I've got to be quick. And I'll ask you if, you, if you're going to the game, come over and say hello if you see me. We'll enjoy a, uh, a half a lager or a shandy. And we'll enjoy the weather and the atmosphere together and it'll be good. Hopefully we get the wind back. I'm not going to talk about the Burnley game today because as I say, it's, we'll talk about that after the game for the fan cams and things. Today we've got two transfer news, views and clues for you. Interesting, interesting players coming from top tier journalists, all the things you like to see and lots to discuss. Before we get into it, please do me a favour guys, hit the like button for me on the video if you enjoy this content. Hit the subscribe if you haven't already. Loads of subscribers joined the channel this week. I don't know why, but I really appreciate it. And we're just a couple of people away from 24K, 25K is around the corner, hopefully. So very exciting times. Hit the notification bell and drop a comment. Let me know your thoughts on today's topics. And let's start with, as I say, consistent themes. Both good players. Both make sense from a homegrown and a squad train perspective, or uh, one of them for the squad train thing and the other one for the homegrown. Both of them financially viable. Both of them solve problems in our squad. And both of them, I think, improve the squad. I really do. But both of them come with question marks about their personality and potential risks in the future that you can't necessarily be sure are irrelevant regardless of how well you do your due diligence on it. Let's start with the first one. Ivan Tony, not a new story. We've heard this before. Ivan Tony linked to Tottenham. In the past, Ivan Tony has twerked for Arsenal, which obviously annoys a few people. People also get annoyed with the fact that his, he's described as very arrogant as a player, as a person. He never really apologised for uh, to Brentford fans for missing out on you know half the season or three quarters of the season and a part of last season as well and look you know uh, some people would describe him as dislikable but as I've been saying if we're trying to get to the world where you have top class players in your squad and I know some of you don't think he's top class but I'll come to that in a second I'll come to his viability for the squad but sticking on the personality thing I think that when you look at people like Josh Kimmich described as difficult to get on with when you look at people like Ivan Tony described as arrogant but their value to the team can't be questioned, in my opinion, in terms of what they can do versus what we already have to do what we need to be done. And I think as you move up the pecking order, you're probably going to find more and more people have elements of their personality that might be considered dislikable. It's very few people become top, top tier calibre at anything in life without having a bit of an ego that comes along with it. To me... I can get beyond the arrogant side of it. I, I can, because I think he's a good player. Where I do worry, though, is his, you know, what, what, what is the trigger of his addiction or his gambling? Is it like a Tanali situation where the guy has, you know, an addic addiction and can't stop himself doing it? The guy, you know, Tanali, already faced or facing a ban and then has now been accused of, of, of doing more gambling and so will face potentially further bans. You know, you, you feel for that guy. You feel for the club, Newcastle, that spent all the money on him. You worry about the guy's future career and you hope that he gets the help he deserves. Is Ivan Tony in the same bracket, bucket? Does he have an addiction to gambling that, that could be triggered again in the future? Or is it just, you know, he enjoys gambling and his personality is almost more, you know, I don't really care about the rules, I do what I want. But it's not more, not so much of a, I can't help myself, it's just, I don't really care. Either way... There's a colour flag that you, that you put in the sand there. I don't know what's, what colour the flag is. Let me know in the comments. Is it a red flag to you? I'm not sure. But for, for me, you've got to worry that at some point in the future, if it's the former, if it's addiction-based, then at some point in the future, you might wake up when we're second in the league and he's banged in 15 goals before Christmas and everything's rosy, and then all of a sudden you hear breaking news on Sky Sports, Ivan Tony has been charged with gambling offences. It's a concern. I don't know the specifics of him and his, and his struggles with that, so I'm not going to speculate, but I'll allow you to speculate for me. Do you think that that is too much of a risk to buy into? In terms of the cost, 50 million quid. This is the story. Brentford have said it's 50 million pound and that Arsenal and Chelsea's interest has evaporated. Again, you've got to question why. Well, Arsenal might have you know, moved their attention to Alex Isaac. And as I said in a couple of videos now, Arsenal have got to the point where... 
despite having similar-ish revenues to Tottenham, give or take 30, 40 million quid, depending on who gets into the Champions League, they're at the point in their squad where they don't need seven, eight players. They need one or two. That's the point I was talking about yesterday. If you want Tottenham to be signing 100 million pound players, then we have to get to a situation where our squad only needs one or two players a season. And that doesn't happen if you chop and change your manager every 10 months. So it all comes back to getting the right manager, getting the right philosophy, and then giving it time to, to play out. In any event, if I, Arsenal have gone for Isaac, I don't know who Chelsea are going for. I haven't seen uh, that story yet. But, you know, we've got a free run at it because it's only Tottenham and West Ham, apparently, who are looking at him. And he doesn't want to go to West Ham. He'd rather come to Tottenham. Again, like I said at the start... He once upon a time didn't want to come to Tottenham. He wanted to go to Arsenal. So if you can get past all that stuff, I think I can. Because I think as a player, you know, he's a brilliant, brilliant striker in my opinion. I know a lot of you say he's not the same guy he was before his ban. His season since January, since he's come out from the ban, hasn't been spectacular. And I, I would agree with you. But I'd also say there's context. There's always context to everything in life. And I think with Brentford, the injuries to Wissa and Buemo and Rico Henry have massively affected their continuity, the kind of dynamism of their natural fluid play. And if Tony was generally a beneficiary of fluidity, then you think, I think he would fit in well in this system. Does he hold the ball up better than Richarlison? 100%. He's got a wonderful first touch. Richarlison doesn't. Is he good back to goal? 100%. Is he strong? 100%. Does he have a better right foot and left foot than Richarlison? 100%. If he's, got better, if he's better than Richarlison at all that, then he's better than anybody else in our team in that back-to-goal number nine role. Is he good in the air? You know he is. Everyone knows he is. I think, from memory, I could be wrong, I could be talking waffle here, but I'm pretty sure I saw a stat once that on last season's statistics, in terms of long balls up to the target man, you have to go all the way back to Emil Heskey with Michael Owen for Liverpool to find a season where someone had as high a frequency of situations where he was asked to do it and as high a aerial dual percentage success rate as Ivan Tony did last season with Raya and the guys at the back banging the balls up towards him. He's incredibly good at it. Now, does that translate to a Tottenham team? Well, Ange Postecoglou doesn't really like that sort of thing, so maybe not. But it's always an outlet that could be put into the kind of options of tactics at some point in the future. But even if not... He's still wonderful in the air, still wonderful, wonderful defensively. You need someone who's good in the air from corners. And attacking-wise, you need someone who can time a jump better than what we have. And he does tick those boxes. So, for me, you put him in the right system, you put the right players around him, and I think he gets back to something like his best. And something like his best, I don't think you're going to find better than him, better than the best version of him, for 50 million quid. I'd probably rather have him than some of the others. There's only a couple of strikers out there that I'd probably rather have. But again, he has a homegrown um, sort of the, the value of that, the homegrown thing. And Tottenham need to work on our homegrown. We also need to work on our uh, squad trained. And that's why we're going to come to the second story in a minute, because I think he does count as one. But we will talk about that in a second. Just to round off the Ivan Tony thing, 50 million quid. I need to know your thoughts. Is the red flag red or is it orange or is it yellow or is it white when it comes to his personality? Do you still rate him as a player? I know he's a little bit older than the likes we're looking at, Santiago Jimenez and Benjamin Sesco and those sorts of players. And for what it's worth, I'd be happy with either of those two as well. I'd even, you know, if you were dream welding scenarioing, I could see a situation where, as I said before a few times now, I think you could cash in if the right offer came along. I don't expect it to happen, but you could cash in on both Richarlison and Sonny. If you cash in on Richarlison, you need two strikers this summer. For me, you could go and get a Jimenez and a Tony for a combined 90 million quid. You sell Richie for 50. If you were to sell Sonny for 80, and I think you could get 80 million for him from the Saudi, mar from the Saudi market. Again, dream world, weird scenario, hypotheticals. Then you, know, you can rebuild the entire forward line and get two top tier strikers like Jimenez and Tony. Let them compete. For me, throw in a couple of wingers in there and it makes a lot of sense. So I do want to know your thoughts. I know a lot of you don't like Ivan Tony, not on board it. I personally, I think, he's, I think it makes a lot of sense. I, re I really do. Notwithstanding, there is question marks about the risk of um, a regression back to his old ways. And that is something that I don't know how you can kind of cut even a conversation with Ange or some psychological review or whatever. I don't know how you can rule that stuff out. I think there's always going to be that risk. As I said, if you can make all those changes at the forward line and then you're looking for wingers to come in, the second story, guys, is none other than ex-Tottenham boy, sporting winger Marcus Edwards. 
A name that keeps coming back up. Obviously, Tottenham have got a 35% sell-on fee, which essentially means that whatever his fee is, Tottenham would pay less than that. And so, you, financially, you kind of sit there and say, well, if you're getting someone at a 35% discount to their actual value, does that make sense? Well, not necessarily, because Sporting will just probably know that and would put the asking price up towards the upper end of whatever the range is so that they can... Even with the discount of the 35%, they're still getting a premium number for it. So, you know, that's like an old supermarket trick. Anyway, the reality is Marcus Edwards, I believe, counts as not only homegrown, but also squad trained, locally trained. And that is necessary for the Europa rules, as I understand it. But I'm not entirely clear, so I'm not going to sit here and talk like I'm an expert on the, the, the squad-trained homegrown rules for Europe, but I think that's the case. Is he a good player? I think he is. And if you look at the stats, if we're looking for, for take-on specialists, if we're looking for dribblers, if we're looking for people with excellent crossing ability, we're looking for people that, that contribute to goals and assists from the wide... Well, you're not going to find someone much better than Marcus Edwards relative to the top 10 leagues in Europe across uh, the last 365 days. His uh, expected um, AG, XAG, is expected assisted goals is in the top 98th percentile. His crossing into the box, top 95th percentile. Take-ons, dribbles into the area, uh, touches in the penalty area, 95, 96, 94th percentile. He's assisting a goal every 0.5 games one in every two games he gets an assist pops up with a lot of goals as well he's not going to offer you anything defensively defensively he doesn't do much he's going to stand on the wing and he's going to wait for the ball and then he's going to take players on and you know what guys I know that there's you know you want the dream world you want the players that are top tier that you know have done it in the Premier League etc and they're going to cost a fortune I don't know how much Edwards is going to cost I don't know but on paper, do you fancy the player? I like him. I think he's, he's got a bit of grit about him. I think he's a bit, he reminds me a little bit of a Morgan Gibbs White in terms of the kind of tenaciousness whenever I've seen Sporting play, which to be fair, is only highlights really these days. I don't really watch the Portuguese league, but um, he always looks like he's hungry for the ball and loves nothing more than terrifying defenders. And when you saw the 4-4-2 video the other day and we spoke about, you know, there's nothing new in there. We've spoken about this, the tactics of how to play against us for ages. If teams have gone from a wide four to a narrow four at the back because they're offering up the space to our wingers because our wingers are not good enough, you put someone like him on the right, someone like him on the left, who loves nothing more than a jukey, tricky run, then if that leads to success with that system, then the guys have to be, the defence have to spread out a little bit more, be more conscious, pay more attention to the wide guys. And in so doing, that creates more space for players like James Madison to thrive, players like Benson Core to be able to slot the ball through, players like an Ivan Tony or a Sesco or a Jimenez or a Sonny or a Richarlison to get on the ball and to do more with it. You need the options off the wide to be able to keep the defence honest and... It's a game of cat and mouse. Tactically, teams that set up to play against us won't know necessarily what the best way is. And if you bring in players that can do that, some days you can play them, some days you have them on the bench. So you have options. You have options to change the game and react to the tactical nous of exploitative managers. To me, as I say, statistically, Marcus Edwards makes a lot of sense for what we're looking for. I'll put all the stats up on the screen as always so you can have a look. See a lot of the green bars in the areas that we're looking for. A lot of red and kind of normal average bars in the areas that are less important, I think, for this position. He's not an all-rounder. He's not an everything. He's not a Kulosevsky. He's very good at a few things, but those few things are what we need. Question marks about his personality, though. Again, similar, not for addiction reasons, none of those, you know, uh, risks in the future, but he left Tottenham because he wasn't happy with game time. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, by the way. I think that's a very brave thing to do and a very um, impressive move for a young guy to make. Not many English players you know, would, would leave Tottenham, where, they, where they're from, and go to Portugal 
You know, they might go to another team in England, but massive leap of faith, massively courageous. And look, it's worked out for him. He, was, he made the right decision. Tottenham were wrong to not give him more time at the, at the, in, the, in the moment, as it turned out. But we were playing Monday morning quarterback there. At the time, the manager didn't rate him or didn't fancy him, didn't think he was ready. He said he was, he believed in himself and he went off. I give that a tick, not a cross. That's not a flag for me. The flag is whether or not if it doesn't go right or if he's not getting the minutes that he wants, is he going to be humble about it? Is he going to be patient about it? You know, we're seeing players like Dragosin not getting very many minutes and we're seeing his agent doing the talking for the player. And if that continues to happen, you're going to have to start to question whether it's actually from Dragosin and he's leveraging his agent as being the, the vocaliser of his disapproval, discontent. I don't know if that would happen with Marcus Edwards, but... Again, just making you aware, if you weren't, that there are not, it's not, not necessarily a personality issue. It's just a, a recognition that he's impatient and he wants to play and he demands to play. And would he play? Where is he going to play? Does he get in ahead of Brennan Johnson? I think he's a better dribbler, a better, ta a better take on specialist than Brennan Johnson. But I think Brennan Johnson is very much improving at that side of the game. But Brennan Johnson isn't a dribbler, I don't believe. He's not someone that does mazy dribbles too much. He's someone who's got a brilliant first, like a brilliant um, acceleration, can kick the ball past and then move into space behind. He, I believe Marcus Edwards is more of a close control, uh, jinky jukey kind of runner and with the ball. And I think that that is something that can terrify, it terrified us, it terrified our defence last season in the Champions League. So um, it, might, it might do the same to defences this time. And again, you have to make them think twice. Someone's going to get close control on him because they can't let him have a run on you. What does that do? It brings up space somewhere else for someone else to move into. And fluid rigidity requires the players around him to understand what's going to happen and to take advantage of the gaps that are created by other defensive teams moving in to get close, to close control. One of the reasons why Liverpool do so well is often because players double mark, and the same with Arsenal, they double mark Salah and Saka. And so that can be frustrating for Salah and Zaka in that they can't get on the ball all the time and do what they, nest, do what they always want to do. But it creates space for Odegaard. It creates space for you know, McAllister or Gakpo or whoever else to be able to move into different positions and make use of the ball. So there's a lot of byproduct benefits of having a take on specialist. And I think that Marcus Edwards is one. Let me know your thoughts, though. Does he, do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you, do you watch Portuguese football? Is there massive areas of a game that I'm missing that, that's... that's uh, there's an incompatibility for the system. Let me know, guys. What I would say is there's loads of wingers out there. There are tricky wingers. Tricky wingers that can take players on are a dime a dozen. They are everywhere. Every team should have at least one. The difference between the good and the very good and the very best is their ability to time the runs, decision-making with the ball, when to go in, when to go out, get that right, and then also look up and find the final ball. Lots of people are very good at doing the first bit, but the last bit is, is, is poor. And if the last bit's poor, then the first bit's irrelevant. I think Marcus Edwards is a good option. And like I say, I'm not entirely abreast of all the rules with regards Europe and homegrown and that's also squad trained, but I think he does tick that box. Let me know if I'm wrong and uh, I'll see you at the game. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come on you Spurs.